Good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming. Welcome back to those of you who came for the first lecture. This is the second lecture in a three-part series called Reasons to Believe. The series aims to provide answers to the three questions that I found myself asking as a college student that eventually led to my conversion to Catholicism. Does God exist? Is Jesus God? And did Jesus establish a church? Last week, we discussed some proofs for the existence of God. That got us as far as disproving atheism, but it didn't get us all the way to Christianity. After all, Jewish and Muslim people worship the same transcendent creator God that we do, and yet that doesn't make them Christians. What makes Christianity unique is the claim that we as Christians make about God's nature, that God is one God in three persons, and that the second of those divine persons took to himself a human nature, becoming incarnate in the person of Jesus Christ, in order to bring about our salvation. So if we're to winnow down our options as theists from just any monotheistic religion to Christianity, we need to examine the person for whom Christianity is named, the man who is called the Christ, which means the Messiah, which means the Anointed One, namely Jesus himself. So tonight's presentation will answer three questions. Firstly, did Jesus exist? and will refute so-called Jesus mythicism. Secondly, did Jesus claim to be God? And I'm going to overwhelm you with 10 points of evidence from Scripture and 10 points of evidence from the early Christians pointing towards Jesus' claim to divinity. And then we'll answer the, the real question here is, is Jesus actually God? Because it's possible that he could claim to be God, but not actually be God. And to answer this third and most important question, we're going to look at the miracles that Jesus did, but particularly his resurrection from the dead. At the very end, I'll introduce you to some resources if you're desirous of further study on this topic. But this answer to the last question of whether Jesus is God is really the, the crux of this whole issue. After all, if Jesus is God, then everybody who worships God, no matter how they do it, ought to be a Christian because they ought to worship Jesus, if Jesus is God. But if Jesus is not God, then nobody should be a Christian. Because if we worship Jesus, but he's not God, we're worshiping a creature, and that's idolatry, and that's bad. <laughs> so <laughs> this, this question of whether Jesus is God is really the, the central thing we have to figure out. But before we get there, let's examine the historical question of whether the existence of a man called Jesus of Nazareth is uh, a claim we should, we should find believable. The vast majority of people, both scholars and laymen, both Christians and non-Christians, agree that Jesus was a person who really existed. They might not grant that he was God, but they don't refute the historical fact that a man named Jesus of Nazareth existed in first century Palestine, that he taught the people there, and that he was later sentenced to death by the Roman authorities for allegedly inciting political unrest. There are, however, a very small group of fringe critics who hold to a view that's called Jesus mythicism, which contends that the historical Jesus is merely a made-up or fictional character. However, we have good evidence, both from biblical and extra-biblical sources, to believe that Jesus is not just a figment of the imagination. In the first place, the Gospels themselves are documentary evidence to Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. Now, some critics discount the Gospels as historical evidence for Jesus merely because the Gospels were written by Christians who, they would say, are biased in favor of Jesus' existence. But as one biblical scholar notes, that would be just as absurd as if scholars of the history of our own country discounted the, the early reports of the Revolutionary War just because they were written by Americans. Okay, We might dispute the individual details of the documents, but we can't write off the Gospels as wholly unreliable just because of their authorship. And in fact, the Gospels are the most well-attested of any manuscripts, bar none. That means we have more copies and earlier copies of the Gospels than we have for any other ancient works, like the works of Homer, or the Dialogues of Plato, or any other ancient texts. We have 
more copies that are closer to their original sources in time for the Gospels than for any other literary works of ancient Greece or Rome. But our evidence for Jesus' existence is not limited to the Bible alone. Both Jews and pagans attested to his existence and to the continued existence of the group of his followers within the first hundred years after Jesus' death. Take as one example the Jewish historian Flavius Josephus, who was born in the year 34 and eventually came to serve in the court of the Roman Emperor Vespasian. Among other works, Josephus authored a history of the Jewish people called The Antiquities of the Jews. His antiquities make two mentions of Jesus. The first one is very brief, in Book 20 of the Antiquities, where he describes the death of the younger apostle James, who was probably the son of a man named Alphaeus and a cousin of Jesus, who, Jesus, who Josephus refers to as Jesus, who was called Christ. The second, much longer passage uh, from Book 18 of this work is the subject of a lot of scholarly debate because the text was almost certainly embellished by later Christian scribes who added to the text to uh, make explicit their claims about Jesus being God and being worthy of worship and things like that. However, scholars have been able to redact those parts of the text and reconstruct the text um, as best they can the way that Josephus would have written it, which reads as follows. At this time, there appeared Jesus, a wise man, for he was a doer of startling deeds, a teacher of people who received the truth with pleasure. And he gained a following, both among many Jews and among many of Greek origin. And when Pilate, because of an accusation made by the leading men among us, condemned him to the cross, those who had loved him previously did not cease to do so. And up until this very day, the tribe of Christians, named after him, has not died out. The existence of the early Christian church is also attested to by pagans, such as the Roman historian Tacitus, who records that the emperor Nero blamed the Christians in Rome for starting the great fire of Rome in the year 64. In book five of his Annals, Tacitus writes, Christus, the founder of the name, was put to death by Pontius Pilate, procurator of Judea in the, region of, in the reign of Tiberius. And even modern scholars who might deny the miracles of Jesus, such as his resurrection from the dead, still don't deny that he existed at all. Dr. Bart Ehrman, a New York Times best-selling author and professor of New Testament studies at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, describes himself as agnostic in terms of his belief about God. And yet, even he says that the view that Jesus existed is held by virtually every expert on the planet. He even wrote an entire book on the subject called, Did Jesus Exist? And I'll, I'll spoil the ending for you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the answer is yes. I've, open, I've only given you a couple of brief examples, but regardless of what you believe at this point about the divinity of Christ or his miracles, the historical evidence for the existence of Jesus of Nazareth has been established by scholars beyond the shadow of a doubt. So, Having established the existence of Jesus, we now need to turn to the claims that he made. These claims and their ramifications will form the bulk of tonight's presentation. And the central idea that I want to get across to you, the central idea that I want to refute, I should say, is the claim that Jesus is merely a good human teacher. And C.S. Lewis is going to refute this claim for us. He, he does this very well in his book, Mere Christianity. And here's what he has to say. I am trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. I am ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sorts of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic, on a level with the man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman, or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon. Or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. 
He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. Now, some critics of Christianity make the rather shallow objection that Jesus must not be God because there isn't a verse in the Bible where Jesus explicitly says, Hello, I'm God. And that's true. There's no verse where Jesus comes right out and says that. But this objection fails on two counts. <coughs> Bless you. Thank you. First of all, not everything that Jesus said and did is recorded in the Bible. And the Bible even says as much in John chapter 20, verse 30, which says that Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. As an aside, just to give you a preview of next week's lecture, this Protestant notion that everything that a Christian believes must be found explicitly in the Bible is itself not found in the Bible. And therefore, the whole Protestant doctrine of sola scriptura, or Bible alone Christianity, is self-defeating, and this entire edifice crumbles on account of its own faulty foundation. But we're going to talk a lot about that next week, so uh, be sure to tune in. Anyway, the second reason this objection fails is because even though Jesus doesn't come right out and say, I'm God, he does come really, really close to doing that on a number of occasions. And to prove it, I'm going to walk you through ten examples from throughout the New Testament that support this fact. Not only that his earliest followers, but even his earliest enemies, <coughs> understood him to be claiming divine personhood. So here we go. Number one. After Jesus heals the paralyzed man at Bethsaida on the Sabbath, the Jews started persecuting Jesus because he was doing such things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, My father is still working, and I also am working. For this reason, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because he was not only breaking the Sabbath, but was also calling God his own Father, thereby making himself equal to God. After Jesus heals the paralyzed man, who was lowered in the roof, through the roof by his friends, some of the scribes were sitting there, questioning in their hearts, Why does this fellow speak in this way? It is blasphemy. Who can forgive sins but God alone? As the Catechism says in paragraph 1441, only God forgives sins. Since he is the Son of God, Jesus says of himself, the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins and exercises this divine power. Your sins are forgiven. Further, by virtue of his divine authority, he gives this power to men to exercise in his name. We see that power, the power that Jesus gave to the apostles, for example, in John chapter 20, verse 21 through 23, where Jesus institutes the sacrament of confession. He says to the apostles, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Your ancestor Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. But the Jews said to him, You are not yet fifty years old, and have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, before Abraham was, I am. So they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. Here, Jesus appropriates for himself the divine name that God revealed to Moses in the burning bush. In Exodus chapter 3, when, God, when Moses says, Who shall I tell the Israelites sent me? And God says, Tell them, I am who am sent you. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Now here Thomas calls Jesus my Lord and my God, and Jesus doesn't correct him. We can see two other examples in the book of Acts where false attributions of divinity are swiftly rectified. In Acts chapter 14, Paul and Barnabas are mistakenly, wor mistakenly worshipped as gods, but they are swift to correct the wayward worshippers. And in Acts chapter 12, 
King Herod Agrippa delivers a public address to a crowd who proclaimed him to be a god and no mere mortal, but Herod, because he took the glory for himself and did not defer the glory to the one true God, was struck down by an angel, the, the scripture says, struck down by an angel of the Lord, eaten by worms, and then died. In that order. <laughs> so why wasn't Thomas struck down for addressing Jesus as my Lord and my God? Well, because he wasn't addressing a merely mortal man like Barnabas or Herod, he was actually worshiping God. After Peter and Jesus had walked on the water of the Sea of Galilee, they got into the boat, and the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. On another occasion, Jesus is asleep on a boat with his disciples. When a great storm arose and began to frighten them, Jesus woke up and rebuked the wind, saying to the sea, Peace, be still. The wind ceased, and there was a dead calm. He said to them, Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great awe and said to one another, Who then is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? That last line, Who then is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him, is a reference to some of the Psalms. For example, Psalm 65 verse 7 says, you silence the roaring waves, sorry, you silence the roaring of the seas, the roaring of their waves, the tumult of the peoples. And Psalm 89, verses 8 through 9 says, O Lord of hosts, who is as mighty as you, O Lord? Your faithfulness surrounds you. You rule the raging of the sea. When its waves rise, you still them. In the Gospel of Matthew, we read that the Magi and even King Herod want to find the baby Jesus in order to worship the newborn king of the Jews. Matthew writes, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the, the time of King Herod, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem asking, Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and learned from them the exact time the star had appeared. And sending them to Bethlehem, he said, Go and search carefully for the child, and when you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. Now we know that Herod wasn't actually planning to worship him, but that's what he said. <laughs> On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they fell down and worshipped him. The author of the letter to the Hebrews writes that Jesus is the Son of God, that he is the reflection of God's glory and the exact imprint of of God's very being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. Furthermore, the Son of God is superior to the angels, as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. And again, when God brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. Here's why I want to make one very curious digression, particularly about the Jehovah's Witnesses. The Jehovah's Witnesses don't actually believe that Jesus is God. The Jehovah's Witnesses believe that Jesus is St. Michael the Archangel. Now this sounds kind of funny to our ears, but it's true. That's, that's what they believe. And so the next time you find yourself talking to a Jehovah's Witness, I would encourage you to point out this passage from the first chapter of Hebrews and ask them why an angel, if Jesus is St. Michael the Archangel, why would an angel worship another angel? Clearly, angels only worship God. And the author of Hebrews quotes actually three prophets in this section from Hebrews chapter 1, he quotes three prophecies from the Old Testament explicitly stating that Jesus, the divine Son of God, will in fact be worshipped by the angels because he's not just another angel, he's God. St. Paul says in Colossians that in Christ the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. In Philippians chapter 2, St. Paul quotes one of the earliest Christian hymns which says that Christ Jesus, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be grasped or exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. Lastly, Paul says in his letter to Titus that we wait for the blessed hope and the manifestation of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. 
Now, the Bible isn't the only source of evidence we have for believing in the divinity of Christ. We have also the testimony of the earliest Christians, testimony from the sorts of people who learned Christianity by word of mouth or by letter. As St. Paul says in 2 Thessalonians 2.15, long before the canon of scripture, that is to say, the list of books that belong in the Bible, was ever compiled. Now next week, at next week's lecture, I'm going to give you a lot of evidence from these first few centuries of Christianity when we, we're going to talk next week about the four marks of the church, that the church is one, holy, Catholic, and apostolic. Next week we're going to discuss why everyone should be a Catholic, namely because the Catholic Church is the one that Jesus himself founded, and the one which still has all the gifts that Jesus wants his followers to have. But for now, we'll limit ourselves to only seeing what these earliest Christians believed about whether Jesus is God. In his letter to the Romans from the year 110, St. Ignatius of Antioch says, To the Church, beloved and enlightened after the love of Jesus Christ our God, by the will of him that has willed everything which is. So he's writing to the church at Rome, and he, he talks about the love of Jesus Christ, our God. Saint Melito of, of Sardis, oh, sorry, I skipped one. Um, the early Christian philosopher Aristides writes that Christians are they who above every people of the earth have found the truth, for they acknowledge God, the creator and maker of all things, in the only begotten Son and in the Holy Spirit. St. Melito of Sardis, a second century bishop in modern-day Turkey, says that the activities of Christ after his baptism, especially his miracles, which we're going to talk about later, give indication and assurance to the world of the deity hidden in his flesh. Being God and likewise perfect man, he gave positive indications of his two natures, of his deity by the miracles during the three years following after his baptism, of his humanity in the 30 years which came before his baptism, during which, by reason of his condition according to the flesh, he concealed the signs of his deity, although he was the true God, existing before the ages. Saint Irenaeus of Lyon, a second century bishop in modern-day France, and a staunch defender of the Catholic faith against the early Christian heresies, writes in reference to Jesus, Nevertheless, what cannot be said of anyone else who ever lived, that he himself is in his own right God and Lord, may be seen by all who have attained to even a small portion of the truth. Clement of Alexandria, a Greek convert to Christianity and philosopher, echoes the beginning of the Gospel of John when he speaks of Jesus as the Word, or in Greek, the Logos. The Word, then, the Christ, is the cause both of our ancient beginning, for he was in God, and of our well-being. And now this same word has appeared as man. He alone is both God and man, and the source of all our good things. The early Christian scholar Origen of Alexandria says that although he was God, he took flesh, and having been made man, he remained what he was, God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, St. Paul says that if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The 2nd and 3rd century theologian Hippolytus of Rome echoes St. Paul, saying, For Christ is the God over all, who has arranged to wash away sin from mankind, rendering the old man new. Now, Novation, here's a story. Novation was actually an anti-pope a false pretender to the papacy, and he was eventually excommunicated. But even people who are wrong about some things can be right about other things, and Novation was at least right about the divinity of Christ. He writes, If Christ was only a man, why did he lay down for us such a rule of believing as that in which he said, And this is life eternal, that they should know you, the only and true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Had he not wished that he should also be understood to be God, why did he add, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent, except because he wished to be received as God also? Because if he had not wished to be understood to be God, he would have added, and the man, Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. But in fact, he neither added this, nor did Christ deliver himself to us as man only, but associated himself with God, as he wished to be understood by this conjunction, 
to be God also, as he is. In a letter about baptism, which is the sacrament that makes our bodies temples of the Holy Spirit by grace, St. Cyprian of Carthage notes that one who denies Christ is God cannot become his temple of the Holy Spirit. Finally, in the year 325, the first council of Nicaea anathematized, which is a big fancy Catholic word that just means condemned, anyone who refused to believe that Jesus is the eternal, uncreated, unchanging Son of God. But those who say there was a time when he, the Son, did not exist, and before he was born, he did not exist, and because he was made from non-existing matter, he is either of another substance or essence, and those who call God the Son of God, sorry, God the Son of God, changeable and mutable, these the Catholic Church anathematizes, meaning these the Catholic Church condemns, because Jesus is the eternal, uncreated, unchanging Son of God. So, having examined the scriptural and historical apostolic evidence for Jesus' claim to be divine, we now need to look at whether he was justified in making that claim. To go back to C.S. Lewis, how do we know that Jesus wasn't a liar or a lunatic, but that he was actually the Lord? <clears throat> the best evidence for this would be the miracles that he performed throughout his ministry. And in fact, Jesus says so himself in John chapter 10. Again, the Jews were divided because of these words of Jesus. Many of them were saying, he has a demon and is out of his mind. Why listen to him? Others were saying, these are not the words of one who has a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Jesus answered, I have told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name testify to me, but you do not believe because you do not belong to my sheep. My sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. <coughs> the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus replied, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of these are you going to stone me? The Jews answered, It is not for a good work that we are going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, though only a human being, are making yourself God. Jesus answered, If I am not doing the works of my Father, then do not believe me. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works, so that you may know and understand that the Father is in me, and I am in the Father. Then they tried to arrest him again, but he escaped from their hands. Now, there are many miracles recorded in the Gospels, but we're going to focus on just one, the most important one, Jesus' resurrection from the dead. As far as I'm concerned, anybody who walks out of his own tomb is worth getting a fair hearing. <laughs> and in this section of this presentation, my goal is to show you that Jesus' resurrection from the dead is not merely something we have to take on faith, but that the resurrection is actually best ex is the best explanation of the historical facts, better than any alternative hypothesis that gets offered by people who would deny the resurrection. The arguments in this last section of my presentation are taken from a Catholic apologist named Jimmy Aiken, whose very excellent book, A Daily Defense, I will say more about in the further resources section at the end of the presentation. So first, let's lay out the pattern of facts that need to be accounted for as we consider the evidence for the resurrection, and then we will systematically eliminate alternative hypotheses by showing that they fail to account for all of these facts. So. According to the Gospels, and to what we profess in the Creed every Sunday, Jesus was crucified, died, and was buried. Then he rose from the dead, his tomb was found empty, and he appeared to his disciples on multiple occasions. And finally, after 40 days, he ascended into heaven in their sight. Any hypothesis that aims to debunk the resurrection will need to account for all of these facts. So let's jump in to some of the most common objections to the resurrection and see if any of them hold water. Speaking of holding water, I take a drink. 
Could it be that the disciples simply went to the wrong tomb on Easter morning? Could it be that they stumbled on another empty tomb rather than the one that still had Jesus' body in it? No, and here's why. The Gospels indicate that the women who found the empty tomb were also eyewitnesses to the burial. Thus, they would have known where the tomb was. The tomb's location was also publicly known because it was the same place where the crucifixion occurred. So the women merely had to return to the site of the crucifixion. The owner of the tomb was also known, Joseph of Arimathea, and he had performed the burial. So any doubt about which tomb it was could have been cleared up by consulting with him. St. Matthew's Gospel indicates that a guard was stationed at the tomb, which would also have served to identify its location. And if the disciples really had mistakenly found another empty tomb, well, once they started preaching the resurrection and becoming such a thorn in the side of the Jewish authorities, the Jewish leaders could have just gone to the right tomb and produced Jesus' rotting corpse to disprove them if it was really there. And furthermore, merely finding an empty tomb doesn't explain why the disciples would have concluded that Jesus had been resurrected. After all, they weren't expecting the resurrection of the dead until the end of time. In fact, St. John's Gospel records that their first thought upon finding the empty tomb was not that he had been resurrected, but simply that someone had moved his body. And lastly, the wrong tomb hypothesis does nothing to explain the disciples' claims of seeing Jesus alive after the crucifixion and conversing with him, let alone his ascension into heaven. Could it be that the disciples stole Jesus' body and then lied about the resurrection and Jesus' post-resurrection appearances? No, and here's why. St. Matthew's Gospel reports that the tomb was guarded, but that the Jewish authorities paid the guards to lie and say that they fell asleep, during which time the disciples must have stolen the body. The fact that this false story was circulating in the Jewish community indicates that it could have been viewed as one of the most plausible alternatives to the resurrection. However, this hypothesis that St. Matthew records was circulating has many serious problems. First of all, if you're paid to guard something, you're paid not to fall asleep. And if you're a guard and you fall asleep at your post, especially if you're living in ancient Judeo-Roman you know, Roman times, that was severe disciplinary action uh, that you would incur, even death, for falling asleep uh, when it's your job to guard something. Furthermore, with the exception of St. John and the Blessed Virgin Mary, Jesus' disciples didn't even have the courage to stay with him during the trial and during the crucifixion. So where does their newfound courage come from that they run away when Jesus is arrested and now somehow they have the courage to sneak past the guards to steal Jesus' body? And if that, were, if that really were the case, the authorities could have just complained to Pontius Pilate about the fact that the guards were being derelict in their duties, and they wouldn't, have had the, they wouldn't have had to bribe the guards to say that they were being derelict in their duties. And lastly, in the years to come, the apostles experienced severe and repeated hardship because of their claim that Jesus rose from the dead. Arrest, imprisonment, beatings, torture, mob violence, in the case of St. John, attempted martyrdom, and in the case of all the rest of them, actual martyrdom. Now, they could have avoided all of these by just denying the resurrection, or not even denying it, but just ceasing to preach the resurrection. And yet, they rebel against every effort made to stop them, and they go gladly to their gruesome deaths, preaching the truth of the resurrection. Someone might lie, it's true, in order to gain money or to gain fame, but they would hardly persist in that lie when it got them treated the way that the apostles were treated and eventually killed for the sake of not a lie, but in fact, the truth. <clears throat> Could it be that Jesus didn't die, but merely swooned or fainted on the cross and woke up again in the tomb? No, and here's why. Think of the trauma that Jesus was subjected to before the crucifixion. Sleeplessness, emotional anguish, lack of food and water, being beaten and whipped, being crowned with thorns, having to stumble under the weight of his own cross. These kinds of things, it's not like we just took a healthy man and nailed him on a cross. He was probably in a state of shock already and close to death already, and then he gets crucified. 
Secondly, the loud cry that he made immediately before dying may have been uh, a sign of a cardiac problem that caused him to, to die. And at that point, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. Blood obviously makes sense. The water is either the clear fluid from the pleural cavity of the lung that may have been pierced as the spear went in, or the pericardial sac that surrounds the heart. But even if Jesus managed to survive having his heart split open, there is no way he could have removed the stone that was sealing the entrance to the tomb and then appeared to the disciples and then ascended into heaven. Could it be that the disciples were hallucinating when they claimed to have seen the resurrected Jesus? No, and here's why. Although we have evidence of some private appearances of Jesus, such as to Mary Magdalene and St. Peter and James the Just, most of Jesus' post-resurrection appearances were to groups of people, including a group of as many as 500 people at once, mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 6. Now, it's disputed among scientists whether true hallucinations are even possible for a group of people. Usually, hallucinations are the result of physiological or chemical imbalances in the brain that affect one particular person in one particular way, not a whole group of people in an identical way. Furthermore, Jesus instructed his disciples to physically handle his glorified body, such as when he told Thomas to put his hands in the wounds, or when he ate a piece of broiled fish with the disciples at the seashore, in order that he would know that, that they would know that he is not a ghost. The post-resurrection appearances also happened over the course of multiple weeks, at multiple times, in multiple places, and then all of a sudden they stop with the ascension of Jesus into heaven, which is not characteristic of how hallucinations typically work. And again, if the disciples were merely hallucinating, the Jewish authorities very easily could have gone to Jesus' tomb and produced his dead body and disproved everything the disciples were saying. But they didn't, because they couldn't. Mm. So let's return now to what I said about in the introduction about this claim that the divinity of Christ is really divisive. Okay? After all, if Jesus isn't God, then his whole life was a sham. His death was meaningless, his resurrection was a hoax, and we're worshiping a creature all the time, so we're probably headed for hell. Okay? Now, St. Paul even says as much in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 14 through 19. If Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation has been in vain, and your faith has been in vain. And we are even found to be misrepresenting God, because we testified of God that he had raised Christ, whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have died in Christ have perished. If for this life only we have hoped in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. Luckily for us, the, re the best hypothesis that we have to explain the resurrection is the resurrection itself. As a Catholic apologist named Trent Horn notes in a lecture on this topic, saying that Jesus is God means that Jesus is a divine person. Whatever is true of Jesus is also true of God, even if it may sound strange at first. For example, since Jesus died on the cross, it is also true that God died on the cross, because Jesus is God. Of course, God did not go out of existence, but that's not what it means to die. Death occurs when a being's parts are separated into their component elements. In this case, death, human death, means the separation of the soul and the body. So Jesus' soul really was separated from his body when he died on the cross. But God still raised Jesus from the dead. And since Jesus is also God, the Bible is correct when it says that Jesus raised himself from the dead because Jesus is God. So, luckily, as we've seen from the presentation tonight, we have good reasons to believe that Jesus really existed, that he really claimed to be God, and not only that, but that he actually is God. That makes every word and deed of his life a saving one. That makes his death out of love for us 
truly efficacious for our redemption, his resurrection and glory, a foretaste of our own bodily resurrection at the end of time, and his whole life, death, and resurrection, the means by which the gates of heaven are opened to us if we cooperate with his grace. This, my friends, is precisely the good news of the gospel, the good news that the very first paragraph of the Catechism sums up so well. God, infinitely perfect and blessed in himself, in a plan of sheer goodness, freely created man to make him share in his own blessed life. For this reason, at every time and in every place, God draws close to man. He calls man to seek him, to know him, to love him with all his strength. He calls together all men, scattered and divided by sin, into the unity of his family, the church. To accomplish this, when the fullness of time had come, God sent his Son as Redeemer and Savior. In his Son and through him, he invites men to become, in the Holy Spirit, his adopted children, and thus heirs of his blessed life. So I want to point you to some further resources. The first book is a tiny little pamphlet called Jesus Shock by Peter Kreeft. And in this book, Kreeft makes the point uh, that the claims about Jesus are so, so strong, they're such uh, extreme claims, that he is God or he isn't, right? That we have to take those claims seriously. And furthermore, the claims that the Catholic Church makes are really strong that the Catholic Church was founded by Jesus Christ, that the Eucharist is the substantial presence of Jesus Christ, body, blood, soul, and divinity, okay? Those aren't the kinds of claims you can just kind of go like, eh, right? Those are the claims where the people who believe them are either right or they're the worst heretics. And, and people who are inquiring into these sorts of things need to take those claims and the extremity of those claims seriously and really investigate whether they're true. The second book I'll recommend is called The Case for Jesus, by Dr. Brent Petrie. This goes through the historical record, um, the historical evidence for the, the, uh, the attestation of the Gospels for existence and the life and death of Jesus. A third book I'd like to recommend is called Counterfeit Christs by Trent Horn. This doesn't go through the life of Christ as much as it goes through how people misconstrue who Jesus is, how people um, try and box Jesus into a particular agenda, whether that be a political agenda, or a sociological agenda, or an agenda from a certain time or place in the world. And Trent goes through and shows that Jesus cannot be boxed in, and he's not to be used to advance uh, someone's particular agenda, whatever that agenda might be. There are two books that I want to recommend that are about the life of Christ, uh, that fall into that genre, which we would call the life of Christ. I would especially recommend these to you if, um, if you'd like to dive into scripture more, but you're not really sure how to start or where to start because it's confusing. It's true that scripture can be confusing. But take one of these next two books with you and let the authors kind of walk you through um, the Gospels and the life of Christ. The first one is by Frank Sheed called To Know Christ Jesus. And the second one is by Venerable Archbishop Fulton J. Sheen uh, called The Life of Christ. So if you're looking to dive into the Gospels and the life of Christ, uh, and you'd like to be kind of led through how to think and how to pray about those things, I recommend to you these two books. The last book that I have, oh, sorry, I have two more books. The second to last book is that one I mentioned earlier called A Daily Defense by Jimmy Aiken. The reason that it's called A Daily Defense is because each page is just very short, um, and there's one for every day of the year that covers all kinds of topics in Catholic apologetics. Um, so if you're the kind of person who you like to get up in the morning and read a little bit from your devotional or whatever, get this book, okay, and just read your one page a day for a year, and you'll be well on your way to explaining and defending the Catholic faith in no time. The last book that I want to recommend is one that I recommended last week, which is, again, The Handbook of Catholic Apologetics by Dr. Peter Kreeft and Father Ronald Ticelli. And of course, I have to recommend to you what I call Catholic Google, which is just the Catholic Answers website. Any question you have about the Catholic faith, if someone says, why do Catholics believe this? Why do you do that? Do you really do this? Go to catholic.com, type in your question, and you're guaranteed to get really good answers. <laughs> Next week's lecture, 
we'll examine the four marks of the church that we profess in the Nicene Creed, namely unity, oneness, sanctity, holiness, catholicity, and apostolicity. And we'll go through also the writings of the earliest Christians to show that while there may be elements of truth in other religions of the world and in other denominations of Christianity, the fullness of the truth is found only in the church that Jesus himself founded, that is to say, the Catholic Church. Let's close with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy thy kingdom kingdom come, thy thy will be done, done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and and forgive us us our trespasses, as as we forgive those who trespass against us. us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. St. Therese, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.